How are you, everyone? Good to see you, uh, many of you again, for the 2024 SIDGE Symposium. This is the Northern California Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Community Foundation's inaugural uh, event uh, for our Center for Social Impact, Development, and Global Engagement at the NorCal MLK Foundation. My name is Aaron Grizel. And I'm the executive director of the Northern California Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Community Foundation. Um, we were founded by the late Coretta Scott King, who, after the legislation passed on November 2nd, 2000, 1983, um, spent three years going around the country starting organizations to help uh, manage the regional celebrations to bring salience to this new national holiday. She came to San Francisco in 1985 and engaged our own Cecil Williams at Glide Church to help to manage that. And after Cecil's retirement in 2010, he asked me to take a uh, hand in being um, the, uh, to head this organization uh, going forward, which we have are, are honored to do. Um, this particular program is a part of our um, question that we've had at the foundation um, about the area of ethics in new technologies. And we have a host of uh, thinkers from around the country and also here locally who are interested in understanding the question of ethics in uh, new technologies. And for us, that means um, ethics primarily in artificial intelligence and ethics in the area of um, uh, predictive models and all of that. And so a lot of our, our, our faith leaders, a lot of our um, scholars and theologians, I continue to tell everybody that, you know, we have at the foundation here, we have ethics coming out of our ears. I mean, Martin Luther King, you know, Howard Thurman, you know, Pauli Murray, you know, we have all of these ethics, but how, how, can we, how can we better participate in this space of new technologies, in these predictive models, in artificial intelligence, in algorithmic equations that drive these instruction sets that go into these predictive models, how can we find a way to um, um, lend our hand to the effort of rebalancing a lot of these inequities that are in, uh, almost like they're built into these equations? How do we deal with that? We haven't heard too much about King's thought and Howard Thurman's thought, the, the, the almost like the progenitor of King, one of the King's mentors. Their thoughts have really connected with the technological area and, the techno and technologies in a new way. And that's what we think we can help in. And these efforts here are what are going to enable us to do that. Now. I'd like to introduce to you our morning panel on technology and climate impacts with Amali Tower, Maria Sousa, Carlton Waterhouse, and Theodora Dreyer to be moderated by our own Afua Bruce. Let's welcome them. Good morning. I think we'll, we'll wake up together, it sounds like. <laughs> um, but I'm so glad to be here um, and so excited for this, um, what I think is a really important conversation. We're here today um, to talk about technology and climate. Uh, both of these things have dominated headlines over the past uh, several years. Technology often being portrayed as something that will save us all, but also sometimes being portrayed as the thing that will kill us all. Um, and climate, of course, is often mentioned as something that's a problem really spinning out of control these days. So how should we make sense of these topics, uh, both separately and together? What's the impact of technology on climate? How does climate inform what type of technology we build, how we deploy it? Uh, the field of public interest technology really allows us to examine both the technical and non-technical aspects of the biggest problems facing society, really centering justice as we design long-term solutions. 
uh, public interest tech, PIT for short, uh, allows us to really take an interdisciplinary approach to solve today's biggest challenges, which are bigger than any single discipline, any single person, mm -hmm. any single entity, any single sector. Uh, and come up with solutions for the future. So today I am excited to have a, uh, to be joined by four experts. Uh, again, modeling this interdisciplinary idea, we have uh, an engineer, a historian, a humanitarian, and a lawyer who will be participating in this conversation today as we examine how technology and climate intersect, how we um, and what we should be excited about, what we should be worried about, and what we still need to figure out. So Molly Tower, uh, Dr. Carlton Waterhouse, Dr. Theodora Dreyer, Dr. Maria Jaosusa, welcome. And thank you for joining us for this important conversation today. Let's go ahead and jump in and I'll pose a question to each of the panelists to allow them to introduce themselves and allow you to get to know them a little bit better. Uh, so Amali Tower, you are the founder and executive director of Climate Refugees. And given your experience with refugees who have fled due to climate change, what questions should communities and technologists be asking about how to incorporate technology into tools and solutions for climate refugees? Thank you, Afua. Um, I, um, is this on? I think it is, yeah. Um, so I'm really happy to be here with you all. And as you heard Afua say, I, I am a humanitarian. Um, I come from a human rights, international law background, and I'm very much a practitioner. And I come to the work now of climate displacement through, you could say, um, the experience of working 20 plus years with, with displaced people all around the world. And there's a couple of things that you learn no, there's a lot I've learned, uh, mostly humility from, from displaced folks uh, who epitomize resilience and are afforded almost no dignity. Um, so when we talk about technology and when we talk about technology uh, affording solutions, um, I get a little bit concerned about um, for whom, you know, <laughs> are they included? Do, I don't know a lot of displaced uh, people who have access to technology. Um, there, I haven't met a refugee who doesn't have a mobile phone these days. Do they have the data to use it? Not really. Um, so when we want to talk about how do we find solutions for the 114 million people that are displaced today in the world, um, 60 percent of whom are coming from the most vulnerable countries to climate change. Uh, about 70 percent of refugees in the world today are coming from the global south, where climate change is disproportionately affecting people who have had almost zero contribution to global warming and continue to do that. Uh, the global north shores up its borders to ensure that people do not come to its countries, and they use technology, uh, surveillance, drones, uh, facial recognition, biometrics, iris scanning, you name it, and, that, and that's the stuff we know about. What about all the intelligence things we don't know about? Um, these are the tools that create um, digital walls, if you will, of, of do people have the access to protection, to enabling and ensuring that the rights, both internationally and nationally, that are sacrosanct, that apply at all times. Do they get to be applied? Not really, because we tend to approach uh, solutions as far, as far as migrants go through a border security narrative than a human security narrative. Mm -hmm. So it, it runs the gamut. Access for me is do they have access to the technology that could feed better solutions that actually provide dignity, protection, and rights. And the, answer largely tends to be no. Are they included in the decision making and the solutions? Not really. Um, you know, the UN are, are using AI now and predictive analytics to determine where are there going to be disasters that we can like help move people out of the way from or help them um, mitigate or build resilience to a drought. That's great. Um, but giving someone a cash transfer who might be a farmer who no longer can farm in a drought, mm. doesn't actually answer the issue of the injustice 
of a farmer who contributed nothing towards climate change now losing his entire livelihood um, for something he has played no role in creating. Uh, a cash transfer of go ahead and stay in your poverty doesn't address that. So AI and predictive analytics to help move people out of the way is great. Does it ensure justice? No. You said a lot there that I'm excited to, to dive in so much. I think one of the things you mentioned, though, uh, that's already really sticking with me is this idea of resiliency mm. and dignity. And often when we talk about mm -hmm. tech systems, we talk about building in resiliency. Yep. But what does it mean to build in dignity and for whom? Yeah. Dr. Carlton Waterhouse, you are a professor of law at Howard University and an international expert on environmental law and environmental justice. You have worked on climate and technology issues both within government at the EPA and with communities as um, an environmental justice lawyer. What skills and knowledge related to technology and climate do community organizations need to develop um, to ensure that government is meeting their needs? If you could solve all of that for us in a couple of minutes, we'd love <laughs> it. Yeah, thank you so much for that question and for the opportunity to be here. Um, I guess I'll say my perspective on this is partially as a lawyer, but before I was, uh, went to law school, I was actually studying engineering, and I was very much interested in the humanity side of engineering, science, technology, and society, and the ethics of using our engineering and science and technology in a way that produces good for people. Mm -hmm. And so that actually is what brought me into environmental law, because I saw environmental law largely growing out of how we use technology in a way that actually causes harm to people mm -hmm. and how can we then now reframe that to provide instead um, good for people. So I think when I think about technology, I don't think about technology as something that's new. And I think mm -hmm. often when we think of technology, we think of, oh, we have technology now, but they didn't have technology. But it's like fire's technology, right? The ability to produce fire is a big technology. Wheels are technology. That's a huge thing. Roads, big technology. All of these inventions, all of these developments, all of these new techniques are transformative, were transformative in the spaces and places where they were. And so one of the keys for us to be able to, I think, answer the question has to do with our willingness to go back and look historically, right? If we wanna see how does technology justly get used, we need to look at how it has historically been used. Who are the winners? Who are the losers? What produces a greater, what produced greater winners? What caused more losers? I think we have to be willing to acknowledge that we are just the latest, not necessarily the most significant even, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Penicillin, for example, right? Um, and so I think for us, we have to take an ethical lens that centers the most vulnerable populations and that makes sure that the vulnerable populations are those that are gonna be protected and good from the way the technology uses. And when the most vulnerable populations are gonna be good and protected, everybody else is gonna be fine. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the lens that I would say we begin with. Mm -hmm. I, I love that you saw me taking notes as you were talking, and I think one of the things that really stuck to me is, uh, stuck with me is technology is not new. Um, we've had technologies before, we've had significant transformations before, and what lessons can we learn from the past? How do we take a look at history to inform the decisions we make about what technologies we develop now and what their impacts are, to your point, on the environment? And I'm hoping our, our resident historian on the panel can help us with this idea of how to look back at history. Dr. Uh, Theodora Dreyer, you are the director of the Water Justice and Technology Project, um, as well as co-founder of the Critical Carbon Computing Collective. Can you elaborate on the findings of your water justice and technology reports, especially um, talking about the roles of algorithms in managing uh, natural resources, and really, I know you touch on policy as well in your work. You do quite a bit with policy as well. So can you talk to us a bit about the policy challenges specific to the water domain? Yes. <clears throat> thank you so much, and thank you for that introduction and your remarks about historical analysis. So um, I'm a critical policy analyst, and I focus on technology and data histories of algorithmic computing, artificial intelligence, and predictive analytics as they relate to environmental justice and climate change. And I do feel that my superpower is 
my historical training and research, I believe that environmental justice is an engagement with historical archives, definitely legal archives and policy archives. And I think by looking at the stratifications of the power dynamics we're talking about today, we learn a lot and we acknowledge the past and we start looking at intergenerational trauma and we start having real conversations about it instead of, you know, going into systems that are premised on its erasure. Um, so I really appreciate those remarks. And also in your opening remarks, um, I do believe that the questions and the power dynamics that we're talking about today require collective action. They require interdisciplinary engagement, um, this sort of paradigm of the um, expert individual who published that one book that solves everything is not the answer. <clears throat> These are really complex historical problems that we're coming into together today. And I'm uh, grateful to be on this panel and to be here in person, being able to make eye contact. Well, you can see me more than I can see you, but you know, <laughs> sharing energy and having these conversations. Um, I'm the director of the Water Justice and Technology Project. It's waterjustice-tech.org. And um, I wanted to share it is a creative studio and critical research platform and directive that brings together activists, scholar activists like myself, um, scientists, engineers, artists, filmmakers to really critically engage how technology is used against water, but also to create possibilities for um, different kinds of water futures and to engage these questions. And I would say two of our key methodological findings is first, um, to put key policy terms to question. Mm. So we don't wanna naturalize these terms. So I'm talking about terms like relief and crisis. And we first came together during the COVID-19 crisis during quarantine to talk about COVID-19 and talk about water po policy and COVID-19 and how terms like crisis and relief that these are not new terms. These are old terms that have been used by different powers, settler colonial powers, imperial powers to perpetuate violence against water and violence against people. And we said, like, what if we put those to question? And what if those became a note of inquiry for us to reflect on together? Um, and so water is super important. Um, it's a precious natural resource. 2% of the Earth's water are fresh water, only 2%. It's historically been a site of contest. Um, and there, for me, are two rough paradigms about water. The first, I think, undergirds big tech expansionism, and it's this idea that water is a commodity. Hmm. That's been abstracted from lived context. It's a commodity that is subject to commodification and financialization. And if you think about that, that's super violent <laughs> to commodify like the most essential resource on this planet. The other paradigm is um, also called reality. <laughs> um, and that's water is a natural resource and it's an ecology. Um, it's precious. It's um, been protected by indigenous water protectors, water and land stewardship. Um, it's, um, it's a source of life. Um, so that's the other paradigm. And oftentimes water is used as a site of control and violence. And this is true in the US indigenous Southwest where I do a lot of research. It's true in the occupied Palestinian territories. And it's true in Congo. So part of the water project is um, uh, with our critique, we have this modality of imagination, what are called water stories. So we actually have a lot of very short form water stories on our website that are place-based and specific. Um, and that kind of uh, defy the abstraction of water and talk about water and technology in different localities around the world. Um, and that allows us to have really um, powerful conversations about water and start br building bridges um, and creating different points of it methodological intervention. So 
I'll stop there for now. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for that. I think how you started um, pointing out that environmental justice is an engagement with historical archives, I think is especially um, really resonant point for where we are today and this weekend as we celebrate uh, the history of um, an yes. impact of Martin Luther King about a lot of the work that we do for justice requires an engagement with historical archives. Yes. And so excited to have this conversation about how technology interplays with that and climate. Um, today you also mentioned um, sort of the ethics and motives around uh, using the terms crisis mm -hmm. and relief. And so how do ethics play? How uh, do motives play? How do uh, politics play in that decision? Yes and those decisions around, and those definitions around those terms. And I know uh, Dr. Maria Jal Sousa, who's the executive director at Climate Change AI, um, which is incubated at Cornell Tech's Public Interest Technology Initiative, you deal a lot with ethics in your work. And so as someone at the intersection of climate change and machine learning, what are some of the innovative ways machine learning is being used to combat climate issues? And what are some of the ethical considerations that should be kept in mind? Yeah, thank you so much for, for the introduction and the question. Uh, at Climate Change AI, we are a, a nonprofit startup that uh, empowers a global community of innovators, practitioners, and decision makers to accelerate the responsible use of AI in service of climate action. So we do a lot of this work at looking at uh, what ways um, AI and machine learning could be used um, in uh, responsible and impactful ways for uh, climate change areas from power and energy systems to agriculture, biodiversity, mm -hmm. uh, transportation, buildings, uh, cities, um, climate extremes, uh, all the, the, the ways that um, we need to tackle climate change, essentially. <laughs> and there are many, many ways, like in 2019, Climate Change AI released uh, a comprehensive report of uh, the many ways that uh, AI could impactfully be, be used uh, for climate action. I won't like name all of the innovative ways in that 60-page uh, report here, but I would want to anchor uh, our discussion here maybe on, on three major uh, areas uh, that are very relevant. So in the space of climate change mitigation, for instance, how we are going to re reduce the, the carbon emissions. So uh, in that space, uh, AI can be very useful to accelerate the penetration of renewable energy into the power grid, so helping us uh, forecast better uh, the demand for energy, uh, help us um, uh, better forecast, uh, plan the energy uh, production as well with the volatility of, uh, volatility of uh, the availability of uh, renewable energy as well. Um, so th there is a lot of potential there. There is a lot of uh, areas then also on climate change adaptation to enable us to better predict um, um, droughts, uh, floods, wildfires, all these um, phenomena that are becoming more frequent and more extreme because of the effects of climate change. Um, and also uh, how to better uh, improve preparedness for, for this uh, phenomena as well. Uh, I want to also make a parallel uh, here, cross-cutting, because it's all, all, almost always like not just a, a matter of predicting one of these phenomena, but how this in, uh, intersects with a bunch of, of other areas. Often uh, drought phenomena or flooding phenomena is very tied to agriculture and food security and mm -hmm. mi climate migration. So they, all these issues are, are very interconnected and, and need to be looked holistically as well. And then other areas uh, that machine learning has effectively been very uh, useful in the last few years is to improve a lot climate predictions and climate modeling. It has been uh, one of the fast-growing fields uh, where AI has been used. 
and then also um, in the policy space with large corpus of data becoming available and uh, machine learning also becoming better at processing these large amounts of data. Uh, there's a lot of potential, but it's more an emergent uh, field uh, in a sense. Um, a lot of the ethical issues uh, that we deal with is looking at AI, uh, and I described a bunch of uh, ways that AI can be uh, effectively used to power climate action, mm -hmm. but at the same time, AI is a general purpose tool, so it can also be used, and it is being used to accelerate uh, fields and sectors that accelerate emissions at the same time. So uh, when you, use, you look at AI applications, we need to uh, really uh, understand that it can be used for good, it can be used for bad, and uh, it, it, we need to scope out what are the, the byproducts and the effects of, of these technologies. Then there are other applications where the outcomes are a bit uncertain uh, and the system level impacts are harder to scope. For instance, um, if we look at the development of electrical vehicles, in theory, like we are de decarbonizing that way, but at the same time, that can create the incentives that um, people have more EVs, that consume more natural resources, and also continue to incentivize the, the, um, the individual vehicle in detriment of the use of public transportation. So th th those more complex scenarios are, are harder to scope from a technological perspective as well. And then there are the bad effects uh, or the inherent effects of AI also consuming a lot of energy, consuming a lot of <laughs> water, uh, uh, and the hardware required to power all these systems as well. So this needs to be uh, also accounted for the impacts of developing these technologies need to be transparently uh, reported, uh, and it's something that we uh, advocate very much for. Thanks so much, and we'll certainly get into uh, some of the environmental impacts of technology. You, um, Maria, also uh, mentioned how these issues, uh, predicting in one area is an is one area alone isn't enough. These issues are interrelated, and one thing affects another. We really need to look um, holistically. And I know everyone uh, sitting here on the panel has had hands-on experience with trying to do that and trying to make things work uh, in and with partnerships with communities. Um, as we've talked about, big challenges require big solutions, including working together in new ways with new partnerships. And so I'm curious, and um, maybe we'll start with you, Amali. Uh, in your view, what are the most significant barriers to implementing cross-sector partnerships in climate technology, and how can these be overcome? Um, yeah, okay, so, um, you know, kind of building on what I said in my, in the other question, um, I think, I think if you think about what I, some of the things I, I mentioned, to me the, the meta question is who's getting left behind uh, with all this sort of apparent technology and uh, information uh, that doesn't necessarily translate to knowledge and therefore, you know, uh, specific solutions for specific problems in specific regions, because mm -hmm. it's not a, a one size fits all, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I totally agree with, uh, with what Carlton said about, so, you know, being a humanitarian, um, you're often also in the development space. And, and now that I'm, you know, looking at things through, well, how, how is climate a risk to marginalized, oppressed people? Um, it's become so apparent to me, and in international affairs, one of the biggest problems as a as sort of like a meta way we organize is, is everything's siloed. So you go into a crisis, <laughs> and humanitarians are there, and then it's like there's this sort of, oh, light bulb's on, your job's done, we're now transitioning into development, economic development, political development, nation building, education, build roads, build schools. And now that I'm going into all these places, that are grossly underdeveloped. Supposedly, we've made all these gains. Mm -hmm. Really? Gains for whom and by whom? Um, you know, where the climate uh, crisis is actually eroding development gains once made. So I'll give you a couple of examples then of, of, of what that looks like. But to me, you know, it's become really clear, like, hmm, 
Is this a lack of development, or is this also how technology could be playing a role to work with development? And is that not also the same thing? Development actors would not consider themselves to be technologists, right? They're like, I'm here trying to build out education at, on a national level and roll that out. You mean to tell me technology doesn't play a role in that today? But there's that silo problem. So, you know, as a humanitarian, there are these like expressions we have, like if you want to educate a country, start by providing pencils. You know, you need to kind of come and look at these things in the situation and context in which they're happening. Because technology is great, but it looks also like building roads. Um, that's one point. The second point, not everyone has access to all these so-called solutions. I mentioned the data. I mentioned, you know, do you have internet? If you don't have a road, where, how do you have the, the fiber optics to build, you know, internet? And this, this looks kind of similar in a variety of places. Um, Miami, where I was last year doing some work in Little Haiti, and, and I think you're going to hear from a panelist uh, tomorrow who has also done some pit cases there. Um, Little Haiti is the highest elevation point in Miami. If, if Miami were a country, it would be the fourth most at risk to sea level rise. So guess what? The uber rich are moving inland and upward. Mm -hmm. um, it's leading to displacement. What many, long before Harvard coined it, uh, is called climate gentrification. If you speak to black folks in Miami, they'll go, oh, we've been using that term a while. Um, what's happening is you go to Little Haiti, resettled Haitian refugees, by the way, is how this community comes about, and there's a massive also problem with heat, which most people don't talk about because we talk about the sea level rise. And when you look at the heat index and the lack of material, you know, sort of ways to solve this problem, um, how we actually... Um, know what the heat is, the real heat, the urban heat index, isn't even in Little Haiti. It's actually somewhere over by the airport, apparently. Mm. Um, so you can't even actually, so where's the data coming from? Is it accurate? Second issue, is it nuanced? I was also in Kenya uh, last year, and Kenya is, by the 54 nations in Africa, Kenya is, 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 a, is a leader, right? A, is a leader at every geopolitical level you can think about, and partner to global north countries. Mm -hmm. Kenya is devastated by climate change. So all there's going to be domino impacts. You mm -hmm. go to the most marginalized ethnically, ethnic minorities, indigenous communities, and they don't have roads, they don't have water. People are dying because they're built, digging water holes and they're having to go so deep that it's collapsing on them and mm -hmm. children have died. Children are foregoing school. Um, roads, water, that's technology. That, though exists in the world of development. So then, you know, I'm, I talked about representation and inclusion. If we're going to use AI to figure out, you know, um, what the solutions are, we also now at COP passed at, at the climate talks this year, or last year now, passed um, this new fund for justice, really, called loss and damage. Mm -hmm. um, there's a nuanced conversation happening. It's not just a disaster and a rising seas and a hurricane that's going to displace someone for a short period of time. No, there's permanent losses, irreversible losses. Those need, to, need compensation, a.k.a. reparations. Technology can play a role. How? You have to speak to people to understand what is the nuanced loss of climate change. You're not going to get that through AI and predictive analytics that said, here, get out of harm's way. And I think um, you bring up this really good point you're underscoring. I think something Dr. Waterhouse mentioned is that technology isn't new, right? Technology, there are many different types of technology. Uh, AI is the technology of the moment, but there are other technologies, right, that we need to keep in mind. And as we think about, in your case, development, um, what role, what opportunity does technology have to play in those, to especially uh, tied to, I think you also mentioned, data should be accurate and nuanced. I'm curious um, if any of the other panelists want to weigh in on this question of how do we think about working in cross-sector partnerships um, and what barriers we have and how do we overcome them? Yeah, maybe I can jump in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, often uh, the issue with creating these cross-sectoral uh, um, collaborations comes from different incentives being placed at different stakeholders. And uh, in a lot of times, it is important to bring those stakeholders together 
even in the project scoping so that uh, the pathway to deployment and the pathway to impact is there. Uh, often we see a lot of incentives, for instance, if we think in the research space, a lot of the incentives are put into place, like the grants are, are the grant calls are for scientists to work with other scientists, but not to working with uh, other organizations outside the scientific ecosystem. So a lot of these incentives uh, need to sh be shaped so that uh, not just uh, the several types of stakeholders and nonprofits, the the corporations, the governmental entities uh, that will be served by these uh, uh, applications that eventually permeate society uh, are included, but also the end users, the communities, how they are being brought together into shaping uh, the, 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 the innovations and, and the development of projects. Yeah, absolutely. I think that point, um, Marie, about really aligning the incentives and um, are we incentivizing scientists or engineers to work with other scientists and engineers? or actually to work in the communities that are being served or not served. And I think, um, Amali, to something you mentioned earlier, this is all done tech um, for whom and the benefit for whom. Did anyone else want to weigh in on um, this particular question? I know, uh, Dr. Waterhouse, you've done a lot of work uh, directly with um, communities in different capacities as well. I won't weigh in on that question, okay. but I will weigh in on another question. Okay, you are ready. Well, in that case, I'm... Um, uh, you, you can't escape my questions, so we'll, we'll go to you for my, for my next question anyway, Dr. Waterhouse. Um, so can you, you talk to us a little bit about how do you envision the future climate technology in terms of its ability to equitably and effectively address the needs of frontline communities? And how do we actually uh, help st stakeholders to move forward towards this vision? I'll ask the other panelists afterwards, but... Um, can you talk to us about how do we make sure that we're using climate technology to really effectively address the needs of frontline communities? Okay, great. So I'm going to start with use technology and then get to climate technology. Absolutely. So more broadly, you know, what we need is uh, folks who can fill a gap. Mm -hmm. between what we get from our governmental services and what communities' needs are. And there is a space of idealism by which we define everything in black and white terms. Mm -hmm. So the government fails to meet a need. It's because the government doesn't care. It's because the government has overlooked them, because the government has neglected them. There isn't the nuanced recognition that's because the government operates based on laws, the government has to work with the resources that is given, the government has to work with the finances and the budget, the government has to work with the tools and technologies they have available. So even when you have the people in the position in the government who are heartfelt committed, work 12 hours every day and this is their life's work, they're still a failure. Mm -hmm. If that failure is read, through an idealistic lens of the government doesn't want to do this, the government doesn't care for you, the government is out to only represent X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. that gap never gets addressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When there's recognition that there are actually allies in the government who are working all the time to try to help this and that and other communities that are in need, mm -hmm. then there's ability to reach across that gap. And this is what we need to happen for communities. Mm -hmm. We need community leaders who can bring the technological expertise to resolving policy questions and problems that government uh, leaders face in trying to address problems. When corporations come into the government, they don't talk to them about ideals, they talk to them about numbers. Mm -hmm. They say your responsibility is to achieve environmental protection under the Clean Water Act. We think that's accomplished through having a permit limit that's at 10 to the minus six or 10 to the minus fifth in the level of this particular contaminant. Community members come in and talk to the government and say, protect us, keep us safe. Mm -hmm. The government official has to decide, is that 10 to the minus fifth? Is that 10 to the minus six? What is that? The community members don't chime in. They don't produce data to say this is the level that we're experiencing and therefore we can't have anything above this. Mm -hmm. That's where we need people to come in. Mm -hmm. People who have technical information that allows them to advocate with the government officials and to help inform them on what the right decisions are. 
Now, we have some of that in the level of the big green organizations in environmental context, but we lack that very much at the community-based organization level. And we need the community-based organization levels to have those conversations with the folks in the big greens, and we need them to also have those conversations with the leaders in the state government and the leaders in the federal government, mm -hmm. the leaders in local government. So there's a huge gap where technology and people who can use technology to represent the needs of communities is essential. And that also applies to com climate. Particularly, though our focus is often on uh, mitigation, we need that primarily in that adaptation, mm -hmm. resilient sustainability space. Where is the heat island effect going to be? Where is it that the flooding is going to take place? Whose basement is going to have what particular flooding happen? This is where we need technology and communities to be able to inform and direct and guide government officials on how to protect them, not just to say, protect us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's incredibly well said, is the desire of communities for, of government is to be protective. And so how can we help uh, get the right technical information to really advocate with um, in partnership with uh, community-based organizations? Um, Theo, I'm curious to hear if you uh, want to weigh in on this question as well yeah. as to how we think about um, effectively addressing the needs of frontline communities. Thank you so much. Um, I've, I've been here thinking about what Carlton was just saying about um, bringing in communities. And then Molly said, uh, developers don't know their technologists. And I just think a multi-scalar analysis is just non-negotiable when we're talking about the relationships between climate change and technology. And I've been thinking about um, Martin Luther King, and uh, there's a piece he wrote in 1964 that is actually a reflection on technology. And I assign it um, to students a lot when we're talking about you know, environmental movements in the 1960s. And like you said, technology is not new. And the sort of constellations of technological power shift over time. And he was writing in a moment that was really marked by big tech of that moment, which was the massively destructive infrastructure systems being built for nuclear power. And there's a lot of groups um, writing against nuclear power. And he was writing during Jim Crow. And these are two, two very interconnected power dynamics. But he was talking about how seductive and grand and shiny technology is. Um, and I have this little quote. Um, he describes technology and men flying and spaceships and how attractive it is. And then he juxtaposes that with society and people, um, and he says, poverty of spirit stands in glaring contrast to our scientific, scientific and technological abundance. So the poverty of spirit stands in contrast to technological abundance. And I invoke this quote because we're, we're talking about false climate solutions. And that is a term that is becoming more and more um, well known and heard. That term doesn't come from our space. It comes from the environmental justice movements and the indigenous environmental justice movements. It's a term, um, you know, Just Transition Alliance, Climate Justice Alliance, Indigenous Environmental Network have used to be able to identify false climate solutions, especially carbon capture and storage and carbon trading um, and these type of things. The NAACP has also done like tremendous work on carbon trading. And I, um, I view my work as sort of contributing to that conversation by looking at artificial intelligence. And AI is, you know, developers don't know they're technologists. And AI operates in the realm of abstraction and extraction. Mm -hmm. So the abstraction are these political renditions and the seductiveness and driving through San Francisco, there's like a million billboards for AI. Um, and so that's, and AI can solve the climate crisis and AI can make carbon trading faster. The thing, AI is moving into already um, data rich environments and all that data has history. AI feeds on old data. And whenever we start looking at the actual undergirding data and environmental laws and environmental policies, you immediately get to communities. 
So AI is in the realm of abstraction, but that data, that water is taking for real communities, real houses being flooded. So if we have a serious conversation about that abstraction, then we're immediately getting into a multi-scalar analysis. And the extraction, the use of um, water to feed AI, there's a lot of equivalent studies starting to be like, chat GPT uses X amount of liters of water every time you run it, and those are great. But we got to center <laughs> settler colonialism. We got to center racial capitalism in this analysis because as, as we know, like in history, environmental justice, those things get relegated to the appendix and to the footnotes. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about power analysis. So I just, I love what everyone's saying because this multi-scalar power analysis, um, if we can do these paradigm flips mm -hmm. and center these things in our conversation, I think we're getting closer to what we want to be talking about. Absolutely. I'm centering the power analysis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. please. <Sorry>. Please. <laughs> centering the power and just recognizing that all data has history, right? Mm -hmm. All There's data no, has history. Um, yeah. Completely neutral uh, data or data without perspective and per mm -hmm. without stories that were intended to be told yeah. by the data that was captured. Yeah. Um, Maria, I'm going to uh, come to you next to start this. Uh, next question, although I, th I suspect others on the panel want to jump in here as well. Um, as we think about the importance of identifying, scoping, and developing projects with positive impact, we know it's hard work. If it were easy, if there were a 10-step checklist, we'd all be done. We wouldn't be here. We'd be doing other things with our Friday mornings. Um, but it's a lot of work. And so people often mention the importance of designing with the end in mind, having a strong development process, applying a rights framework. Um, but what suggestions do you have to actually start putting these things into practice? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think as, as te technologies often fall into this pitfall of having this cutting edge method or uh, this cutting edge technology and falling into this trap or, or this p common pitfall of trying to find the nail to a hammer uh, to use their technology on, uh, and that's sort of uh, what we should be trying to avoid with AI as well. Uh, and some of the ways to actually do that is um, through the circling back to my answer before about involving multiple multi-sector st stakeholders uh, that really help scope the pathway from these technologies from development, from, from research development to, to deployment. Uh, and that's one of the ways. But often uh, more higher level and more important considerations, even in how these teams are assembled, uh, is very important to one, how they are uh, addressing equity considerations in their projects. That is very important. And one thing that often ties to this is how the project all, all also addresses diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, within their project. Mm -hmm. And often we see that if you have a very diverse uh, diverse team uh, not uh, in uh, a bunch of axes those equity considerations are mu 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 much better scoped out as well mm -hmm. so th these things circle back to each other and also um, not thinking uh, just from the project scope but all the way through impact to the communities and who, who this serves in the end mm -hmm. absolutely again keeping in mind throughout the whole process and who this serves at the end. Amelie, I know that you do a lot of work in this space and you have done a lot of work here in how we think about applying especially a rights framework to the work we do. Can you talk to us a little bit about what does that look at like in practice? Um, sure. Um, so I, if I may, mm -hmm. I, I, I feel like we'd be remiss to not sort of pause on something mm -hmm. uh, incredibly important happening as we speak um, in The Hague. Um, um, if you don't know, the International Court of Justice, which is one of the principal organs of the UN, um, is hearing, m certainly in our, my lifetime, the most historic case um, right now of what is on, on the atrocities all going in Gaza. And um, there's definitely a climate impact and component also, not to the case, but what, what's happening in Gaza, and if, I'll, I'll circle back to that. But um, I think we have to talk about these things 
as they're happening right now and as they're applying mm -hmm. to violations of international law and human rights law. Um, Israel has, is using AI mm -hmm. in how it is bombarding Gaza. It's called the gospel. That's mm -hmm. the program that, that they're using. There's actually three programs, but the one that actually makes the determination of where it's going to bomb is called the gospel. And there's supposedly um, all this data then that's, you know, at a microsecond figured out uh, or, or analyzed, you guys are technologists, you know the right terms, to, dis to determine what's the target. And then there's supposedly um, human beings who look at that data and then take that up the command in the military structures to say this is the target. <sighs> there have been 29,000 bombs just since this is up to about November, that have been dropped in the smallest and most densely populated uh, place on the planet. Um, by contrast, in, and that's just in six weeks, by contrast, the United States dropped 29,199 bombs uh, in Iraq over the whole of the country in one year. Mm -hmm. That should give you an idea of how bad it is, and we don't need to agree on anything, but those are facts. Um, that is largely happening through AI. Um, there is no law that figures out how we use these things. We need to come to terms with that. Uh, but there are definitely laws as to how laws of war, laws of human rights, laws of the environment, and all of these things should apply in a virtual world as well. Um, Lastly, I want to say that um, there's very much a climate component here as well, because uh, Israel and Palestine, uh, we, we, if our global temperatures have increased to 1.1, mm -hmm. and we're already in a really bad place, um, in 2015, the Paris Agreement said we were, we were going to try not to get to 1.5. We were going to commit to holding to 2. Um, Guess what? Israel and Palestine is already at 1.5. Mm -hmm. uh, by the end of the century, Gaza will be at 4 degrees Celsius. Um, when you're fighting an occupation and a 17-year blockade, 75-year occupation, um, and now a bombardment where nearly 29,000 people are dead uh, in 97 days, um, how do you combat climate change? Absolutely. Uh, how is it disproportionately oppressing and marginalizing you? Um, there's an opportunity here for the geopolitical and humanitarian crisis that is ongoing uh, to also be looked at through an environmental lens. And I think, again, I would be remiss not to mention this today. When a historic case is happening, it is Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, you know, weekend on, on Monday, and if we're not talking about social justice, then I don't know what we're talking about. So, you know, there you go. That is the most stark example of AI I could, I, I would be remiss not to mention today, is literally killing people. Mm -hmm. Now, Molly, I think um, one of the things you raise is something I think is uh, lost sometimes in the conversations about technology and climate or AI generally, certainly AI and climate, is that there a lot of the conversations can center around future harms and what happens if the technology goes rampant, what happens when the technology of AI causes all of the robots to attack us all. Mm -hmm. But um, there are real harms happening today. Mm -hmm. There are real challenges around issues of equity and justice happening today. And so there are real challenges around climate <coughs> impact today, affecting lives today. And so it's important that even as we have conversations about making long-term systemic change, long-term processes to change in, changes in regulation or laws, we remember and also try to make a difference for how the technology and how the climate is affecting lives today. Yeah, just, just the, exactly. I love that you said that, Afua, because I think the, nut, uh, the, the thing that people forget in the, in the zeitgeist is this isn't a future scenario. Climate, as well as how AI is being applied to, in, this, in the example I gave, create, create mass atrocities, it's ongoing. 
right? So these are not future scenarios, and the conversation is so prescient and relevant. Mm -hmm. Can I um, build on that? Yes, please really do. Quickly. Theodore. I, today and past tense, um, and I love what you said, like what does it mean to have climate change solutionism during a genocide? And um, one of the things I saw at work in the occupied Palestinian territories um, in terms of water apartheid mm -hmm. is a very old law yeah. that was created in 1967. Um, and this was called Military Order 158. And this was a time when um, the major water company, Mikorat, began collaborating with the Israeli military to uphold water apartheid. So this is a very, very old water law. Um, and this same company today is leading climate solutionism for water yep. um, throughout um, the world. It has branches in the United States and Latin America. Um, it is set to control and oversee over 3,000 water pumping stations and is creating a sustainability agenda for optimizing water resources. But then the question comes, what does optimization mean when we're not confronting these underlying power dynamics? And water apartheid looks like um, Palestinians prior to October 7th only having access to 70 liters of water a day, which is well below the World Health Organization average. Um, Israelis consuming four times as much water. Average Palestinian family spending 33 to 50% of their income, income on clean water supplies. So that's what water apartheid is. And so if we're not looking at these, this old data mm -hmm. and these old companies, um, like that are undergirding AI innovation, then we're not doing climate justice work. And it's perpetu perpetuating water crisis and it's perpetuating climate crisis in the name of public interest. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thank you. I'd like yeah. to jump in on that. Please do. Piggyback yeah. on that and, um, you know, go back to kind of some of the early ideas about technology and, and Jackie Lou, for example, talking about technology as a technique. Uh, and so we kind of think about technology as, you know, a mechanism, a, you know, an electrical device, but, you know, political systems are technologies, mm -hmm. you know, economic systems are technologies. And I think one of the challenges we have, particularly in the United States, right, because we have an outsized footprint in terms of our per capita, uh, you know, uh, greenhouse gas production, mm -hmm. right? And then we have an outside hist outsized history in terms of the number of greenhouse gases that we have placed into the atmosphere. And I think it also puts on us, therefore, a responsibility as citizens of this country to help develop the technology mm -hmm. that will change that scenario. And when you mention that water company, mm -hmm. it, it reminds me of the fact that we participate in the success of American corporations. Yeah. And so when American corporations are the problem, we cannot distance ourselves from them by just pointing fingers. There has to be some technology developed that allows us as citizens to move corporations that we support into practices that actually are helpful for people. And if we don't kind of create that technology, we will continue to replicate all of these adverse effects that come from technological development. So in the context, for example, of you know, in the environment, we have PFAS all over. We have PFAS in our fresh water. We have PFAS in our fresh fish. Mm -hmm. We have PFAS in our bloodstreams. Mm -hmm. PFAS is a chemical that was developed by corporations that were attempting to produce products that we would buy. Mm -hmm. Where do we have the conversation with those corporations that are providing us with those products that says you have to do this a different way? Or is that our government's responsibility? And if we are in a democracy, aren't we the government? So I find that there's a kind of a disconnect for us, particularly in America, where we have all this development, we have all this technology, and we consume the goods from the corporations, and we elect the people in the government, and we point all kinds of fingers. Now, I'm not trying to release from responsibility, right, the CEOs and the board of directors and the shareholders or the elected officials. but. I'm troubled by how quickly and easily 
we distance ourselves from responsibility for these behaviors that actually we are intricately tied to, an inextricable mm -hmm. web that we have, as Dr. King said, mm -hmm. right, that ties us together. We need technological innovations that allow us to move our corporations that depend upon us, right? They can't exist. All of them are not multinationally as successful as some of them are. They can't exist without us. And yet we feel that we are bound to them. Whatever they do, we're bound to it. I don't like the way Apple is kind of managing the new iPhone and slowing down the data of access of the old iPhone. But what can we do? So somehow we've got to get past that gap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good call to action for us all and recognizing, as you said, if we're in a democracy, then aren't we the government? And as you also said about um, what can we do? Uh, what can we actually do in holding companies accountable and holding, in holding corporations accountable? Marie, I'm going to um, come to you next. Um, so we're having this conversation around balancing what we can do, what we can't do, different policies. Um, and as we think about how to balance between optimizing specific solutions and community impact versus society level impact, how should we begin to think about that, right? Some, the impacts of climate um, can look differently for specific individuals, communities versus broadly. Uh, similarly, the actions, individuals versus communities versus the world can take can look different. So how do we think about um, balancing uh, and optimizing specific problems versus widespread impact? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I will tie this back to some of the points that uh, Dr. Waterhouse uh, just mentioned. So it's interesting that um, uh, a lot of the conversation nowadays um, is about how we are going to reach net zero. So everyone is aware that we need to re uh, reach net zero. There's a lot of raising awareness for individuals, a lot of awareness for companies. Everyone sort of tries to, to move more sustainably towards uh, options and products that are like that. One thing that we often miss is that as we develop these new technologies, uh, the resources often are coming from Global South to power sustainability in the Global North, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I always try to look at technology development uh, with this lens that development is often, uh, technology is often an accelerator of development. And, but development is often a, a, an accelerator of inequity. And that's what also ties to, to this climate change uh, action that is happening all around the world. A lot of inequity is stemming also and uh, exacerbating from that as well. So as, as uh, individuals, we really need to be aware, OK, do I need to have a, a, a new phone every year or every couple of years? Do, do I need a new laptop? Where are these resources that power my 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 devices coming from? For instance, uh, as we choose alternatives, like is an electric car uh, um, uh, the right solution, or should I, as an individual, be asking my uh, municipality, my my district, for better uh, transport uh, public transportation choices? So it, it's really looking at uh, uh, both where individual action can help, but also where sort of our decisions impact the offerings that uh, companies, governments mm -hmm. uh, put forward for the communities at large, and how this is all interconnected in the end, because supply chains are global in the sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I think what you said about um, as we lean more into technology, the effects that it has, and sometimes uh, using the resources of the global south to power the productivity and the gains of the global north is really, uh, really important, something that we should sit with and examine. I was just told that we have time for a couple of audience questions. Whoa. So if anyone has a question, oh, I already see one hand here. Um, we'll go ahead and start uh, just uh, right in front of you, Aaron. Yeah. Hello. Yep. <clears throat> Thanks, y'all, for um, all your all your thoughts and, and words. Um, my question, I think, starts with Dr. Sousa. Um, 
but uh, if, if any of you all have thoughts. My question is, do you see AI and machine learning modeling as a form of maybe Columbusing or like recolonizing solutions and predictive models that we already had from you know, indigenous communities, frontline communities, and folks who have been like sounding the alarm on climate crisis and you know, environmental degradation and displacement for decades? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I have uh, maybe my background. I'm not a computer scientist, so my background is actually uh, from engineering. So a lot of what we are seeing now with machine learning and AI is uh, because there are there is more data, there is more uh, availability of computation. Uh, there's this sort of promise that AI can be used for so many things, but at the same time, like in engineering, like different breadths, simpler breadths of machine learning or intelligent systems, you, if you want to call it, that consume a lot less resources that don't need barely uh, uh, data, have been used for a long time and have uh, accelerated a lot of innovation and a lot of the comforts uh, that uh, we have today. So I don't see AI as a, a solution for all. And there are many other ways that are not like, OK, just give me every data in the world. This machine, uh, this algorithm can learn uh, by its own, not incorporating any uh, indigenous knowledge, any no, expert knowledge even uh, in the process. So I believe that there is a lot of um, work still for expert driven systems, um, uh, incorporating um, human knowledge into systems. And some of the, uh, them can use uh, a part of AI, some probably don't need AI at all. Uh, and some uh, will need to be AI driven. Uh, so, so some problems are, are just too hard for, for humans to be able to parse the amount of information and the complexities that exist for some problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, you, and I see we have one other question, but just want to uh, comment on what you said. Maria, I think it's also important that we do acknowledge the cases where AI is really helpful, right? There are plenty of use cases where AI is helpful, to your point. There's some challenges in going through vast amount of data or the level of predictions that we uh, would like to make that humans at this point, we don't know how to do it, but AI, AI can be helpful in those situations. And so I think part of the balance is also understanding when technology is the right answer, when AI is the right answer, and when it isn't. Thank you for a, a fantastic uh, conversation, uh, much needed. I'm Fatima Shafi from Spelman College, and I'm glad to be here and learn all this um, information. Uh, one of the things that Dr. Bullard always says is that all communities are not created equal. Mm -hmm. And I want to add to that, all states are not created equal. Mm -hmm. And state possess abundance of power, especially if you look at the states that are really uh, impacted by climate change in the southeast, like Texas, mm -hmm. Louisiana. And when you look at the power of state to even interfere, what you said, the stratification of the power, when Hurricane um, Harvey hit, before that, the governor Abbott started saying that this is emergency. No corporation is going to be held responsible for act of God. So he mm -hmm. stopped all the monitoring during that period. And in the uh, community of Manchester, mostly Latinx, they had this spell that at some point was 325 level of benzene, mm -hmm. which is really way below that you wear moon suit. And then they, they, neither EPA nor the state responded for monitoring. And once Environmental Defense Fund sent their mobile, they did the data, what happened? The state rejected the data. Mm -hmm. They said, well, you know, we don't know about how good this data is. So I think that the problem is way even broader mm -hmm. in terms of the crisis of democracy mm -hmm. and, so and is your, access. Is your question around 
um, yes. how we can how do we how, how do we can we get governments this? to um, yes. act on the data even I mean uh, at not I would say it's even more basic than mm -hmm. that because here the the government prevent the generation of mm -hmm. data mm -hmm. and then when community is very resourceful and get you know NGOs involved and generate that data they said that data is mm -hmm. not good enough. So maybe how do so we it's, think about it's how do we really talk about democracy and that power dynamic that you mm -hmm. were talking yeah. and come with solution for the environmental injustices mm -hmm. that are going to be intensified and magnified because mm -hmm. as you know climate mm -hmm. is a So how do multiplier. we think about technology uh, data and democracy together? Yeah. Could I quickly say something? Uh, yes, you can. I, I don't think we, uh, we, we ever said the word bias. Um, and how can we have a conversation? I mean, f forget all the like grandiose thoughts and ideas. Just think about it as a human being. Everything you come to, you're biased. As I speak, I'm biased, right? <laughs> Which is why when I gave some numbers earlier, I was like, these are facts, you know? Um, and I probably even got the global warming stats wrong, you know. But, but, but nonetheless, let me let me just, um, which I told my fellow panelists about earlier. Um, this happened in um, I want to say November or, or no October. Here's a question posed to ChatGPT, and we can all Google this and look. Same question: Do Israelis deserve justice? Uh, justice is a fundamental principle that applies to all individuals and groups, regardless of their nationality or background. And there's more, but I'll leave it there. Same question, do Palestinians deserve ju justice? The question of justice for Palestinians is a complex and highly debated issue. Many people and organizations advocate for the rights and justice of the Palestinians, particularly in the con context of the Israeli, okay, and it goes on. Insert whatever topic you want, ChatGPT is going to spit out what is available. And so to not talk about our prejudices, our biases, or um, the fact that indigenous folks, to Nick's question and Maria's answer, are they experts? Do we live in a society that values that knowledge? Or do we carve out intentional spaces mm -hmm. to capture information that hasn't, what, been peer reviewed or, right? We've got to address that big elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the question um, that you're, you're, one of the questions I think that you're getting to, Molly, is, who do we consider experts? <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Do we let people be experts in their own lives? And Looks do like we it. listen to yeah. the expertise um, from a variety of different spaces and from a variety of different people, tying back to how we started today's conversation about big challenges require big solutions with new partnerships, new stakeholders, interdisciplinary thinking. Um, I want to thank uh, all of the panelists. Oh, I'm so sorry. One more question. Yes, uh, Dave, go ahead. Two more questions. Just kidding. Okay. <laughs> if you have, if you have, is this on? I, I guess. It is. Yes. All right. If you have the time. So, Dr. Dreyer, you said something really interesting, which is, oh, you know, the data is coming from the past, and we're interpreting it. But the other thing that's now happening is through the churn, new data are being created constantly through the algorithmic logics of these systems, and they're gaining veracity. You know, they're becoming real. So there is absolutely this historicity to all these data, and it's simultaneously generating new information. So how do we start to build the kind of knowledge systems of that both and moment? You know, it's not just for you, but as you're all thinking about that, like the new data are being generated given truth and now perpetuating themselves and then feeding back into the systems. So all of this is happening simultaneously. How do we think about that? What does it mean for these questions of democracy and access and so forth? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you um, for that question. I'm just, I'm just reflecting on what everyone's saying and thinking um, through this in real time. But it, I was thinking about another Bullard quote um, and he said, the burden of proof falls on the communities, um, not on the perpetrators. Mm -hmm. um, and this gets into the politics of data and expertise that we're talking about right now. And um, there is something about this mass generation of 
information, like overabundance of information. And as someone who studies um, settler colonialism a lot, I see how information, how it functions as a, like an under-documentation, mm -hmm. but also an over-documentation. And like I've read thousands and thousands of pages of congressional records and like, and I'm not chat GPT, like I'm just one person um, and it's a lot of work. But uh, something else that Martin Luther King has written about that inspires me is staying with the trouble, staying with the conflicts and the contradictions, like let's not try to collapse everything into binaries. And so maybe this is where we, this is where it happens, like, with the data and with the information and honoring the expertise of those folks who've been doing this burdenous labor, like in life or death conditions, these frontline communities to document their experiences. Um, and I, you know, I just finished a piece, my editors are waiting. Um, there's a youth organi organization, National Indian Youth Council of Albuquerque, who in the 1970s did a lot of data policy analysis and work to intervene into these like colonial modalities of environmental impact statements in reporting. Mm -hmm. And I've been reading their work in the appendices and the footnotes where they're relegated. Um, and they're just making really powerful critique about the data and information. And they know the history of quantitative water law. They know the history of allocation. They are the experts. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we don't need to get swept away and seduced by the like mass production and the currents of information being produced and the stories being told about that information by the Jeff Bezos characters. Um, maybe we can engage the contradictions of this information by listening to different teachers um, for different interpretive advices. But I'm just, I'm very super inspired by you all and by these audience questions. So thank you so much, yeah. We have one more question. Yeah. At least one more question. Awesome. La yeah. Last question, maybe. Um, thank you for this panel. This has been super insightful, and I love the diversity and backgrounds. Um, I'm Megan Yee. I'm a research software engineer um, at an environmental NGO uh, based within UC Berkeley. And I think one of the questions that stuck with me from this conversation and I feel is not fully resolved yet and brings us back to the beginning is the question of what do we mean by technology? We've heard a lot of different <laughs> definitions. I think we've heard the definition that I'm more familiar with, which is AI and machine learning and kind of the hot topic of today. But we've also heard the definition of fire and mills and uh, you know, different structures um, that govern society as we've moved through history. Um, and so I'm curious whether technology is just progress and what does that mean? I know there's kind of talk of progress being the failed enlightenment project. Um, so I, I'd love to hear your thoughts and maybe see if we can pinpoint a definition uh, and maybe it differs also by, by discipline. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love your thoughts on that, thank you. Great question, do you wanna go? Thanks, Amali, for volunteering to start on this. Moderator, <laughs> uh, 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 Yes, yes, no, that's fine. Um, well, I'm probably not going to help get us to an answer. Um, one of my earliest prof uh, professors said something to me. Um, you, you have to, uh, anything you're studying, you, you have to look at it in its intellectual context. Mm -hmm. um, as a humanitarian, who works with people who are displaced and in the poorest and marginalized places on the planet, who don't have access to what the global north considers technology. So for me, roads and schools, yeah. If you're poor, um, and we don't have to go to Somalia, let's, let's go to little Haiti, right, in Miami, where, where I also have worked. Um, and, and you go there and talk to people in Liberty City and Little Haiti, and then contrast that to the same questions you'll ask people that live in downtown Miami, uh, and you're gonna get vastly different answers. Because it's the intellectual context in which that oppression is happening, right? Do I have access? No. My next question, what limits that access? That's how you find a solution. And that, to me, is expertise. 
And that's all that climate refugees exist to do. To me, the only sources of information is the community, mm -hmm. is the person who is being, a crime is being perpetrated upon, whatever, insert, mm -hmm. da, 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 right? Because the context changes. So when I go to Little Haiti, I'm not talking about international law. But when I go to Gaza, yeah, I'm looking at international humanitarian law and how it protects the natural environment, mm -hmm. right? It's context. Mm -hmm, thank you. Okay, um, I think we have one more question. Uh, yeah, and I think this is the last one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> last, last question, <laughs> well, take us home. Uh, yeah, so, so th thank you so much. Um, we will give our thanks after this last question and, and do the whole thing. Um, so, so Dr. Waterhouse, this, this is um, spurred from your, um, uh, from your highlight about the way law is sort of done in this context of, you know, do we need 10 to the negative fifth? Do we need 10 to the negative sixth? What, what, what is it that we need with respect to that and how the community knows something's not right. So how do we quantify that that's not right so that we can, you know, put it in our equation to do that? So uh, let me ask you this uh, for you, Dr. Waterhouse, and then everyone, everyone else, and, and Dr. Dreyer, um, you as well. So what is the... Um, you, so are, are you, are you, is the suggestion that the community organizations or these local organizations, we, we work to find a way to bring in some sort of quantitative element, maybe by partnering with a university to find the math for um, a way to explain the problem on the ground, say, for instance, in your. I'm, I'm trying to get to. I'm, I'm trying to get to. What is it specifically that we need to be thinking about on the ground so that general purpose government can understand clearly what's wrong? So let let me try to use an example with lead. So lead is one of the oldest environmental justice kind of phenomenons we have in the country, right? We date it back to, you know, the early 1900s when it's being used in paint. Um, and we have doctors who are saying at that time that we're seeing kind of disparities in the experiences of children uh, from their exposure to lead and that these disparities increasingly are seen in children who live in these urban environments where there's large levels of, of lead and this paint is peeling and it's not well maintained. And uh, the lead industry actually has an association, like uh, the lead industry actually supports an association that is actually talking about this, which is surprising. Um, at the same time, lead gets used and introduced in gasoline. And then the problem spreads because now the lead is not just limited to people who are living in that kind of housing, but also to anyone who lives adjacent to a major thoroughfare. And particularly for children who are living in places where there's dirt, where they are gonna get exposed to that dirt, or where they are living and breathing in the lead. Lead is heavy, so it falls quickly. So lead is in our environment in the United States. Mm -hmm. Right? It's all over. African Americans find themselves disproportionately exposed, uh, disproportionately exposed and disproportionately poisoned by lead. Even as our level of lead exposure has decreased, and it has drastically, because we got lead out of fuel, because we stopped having paint that was made with lead, there's still lead out there. There are still houses that have lead paint. There's still homes that have lead in their soils as a result of exposure either from gasoline for, uh, use or from lead smelters or from lead mining. Now, when I have a meeting and I say, we want to deal with the problem of lead, um, we at the Environmental and Climate Justice Center have developed a lead survey where we go through and look at all of the lead policies from all of the states across the country mm. to see what is the protection they're providing people from lead. 
when we do that, there's about 20 questions we're asking about what the state is doing to address the problem of lead. Because you can't just say protect us from lead because there's lead in the soils, there's lead in the air, there's lead in the paint. How do we protect you? Do we actually require people who are uh, leasing property to do lead analysis before they have people who can come in? Okay, we do that. What level of lead is the actual level that is gonna be acceptable if it's found in dust in the home? Is it zero? Is it 0.5, you know, micrograms per kilogram? What is it? Same thing for lead and water. There's lead in the solder that is in some of the pipes in our homes. And even after to replace all of the lead in the public lines, right, which is happening through billions of dollars of funding that the bipartisan infrastructure law put out there for lead, even after to replace all the public lines in the inside of the house, some of us have lead in our pipes and some of us don't have lead pipes, but we have lead solder. How much lead in the water is going to be okay? And if we just say zero, we can't have any PFAS in the water, there can be no lead in the water, there can be no X, Y, Z in the air. If we call for pristine, then all of our companies are shutting down. They're shutting down because there isn't a pristine process that actually allows us to live in the environment without doing violence. So either we have to be ready to radically change the way we live our lives, or we have to be able to talk about levels of what's acceptable. So we need expertise in our communities through partnerships and otherwise, so we can have communities go to talk with specifics about levels of what's acceptable when they're advocating for what their needs are. So is there an information gap in terms of the, the flow of information, your 20 questions you find out? Is there a flow of information gap coming from that information too? Because I, I don't know if uh, this is, this is, uh, I don't know if my grandparents mm. knew all of that information that there was lead in the pipes and that there's lead in my house and that it can do this sort of thing so that they can say, no, I don't want that. I want to change, you know what I mean? So the information about what is being done, that seems to me to be a slightly skewed, you know, two-way street. So um, how do we deal with that? I think this is the work of public interest technologists, is to say, how do we work in, within communities? How do we make sure that we have people from within communities who have both the technical and non-technical expertise? Um, because, you know, this idea of how does the lead affect us, what is that level? It's a very technical question. But also, I live my life. What is my quality of life like? That's a very non-technical question as well. So it really takes that interplay. So we think um, figuring out this answer and how we then get to policy changes, how we then get to corporate changes and more, is the work of public interest technology. And the Public Interest Technology University Network has actually funded a number of these programs across the country at um, many of its member universities. I know at um, Boston University, they have a large center which um, is uh, centered, I think, in their School of Data Sciences and has, a, I think it's um, the most diverse uh, school right now, and they have their students working on issues that matter to them. And the students work in local communities, they work in, on issues that matter uh, to them, and they work with the um, Boston uh, City Council to the extent that the Boston City Council, now when they have a question, they go to this group of students to say, help us figure out what's, what is the actual number that we need in different situations? What's the actual number that we need? What is the actual data on the ground? What's the actual sentiment on the ground? And they go to these centers and they know uh, the PIT UN has funded these um, types of PIT clinics across the country. There are also a handful of, actually more than a handful probably, of nonprofit organizations that are doing similar work. There's uh, Code the Dream, which is based in um, a city in North Carolina. I don't, it's based in North Carolina. Um, and uh, they 
essentially provide um, technical education, uh, lots of programming courses and apprenticeships to students, mostly immigrants, mostly people who are you know, college age or much older than college age. It started as something for um, people who were dreamer status who couldn't get into college but needed that training mm -hmm. to say, let's provide you with this technical education and what are the problems that you are facing in your communities and let's build software around that. So one of the programs that they've built that's been really successful is um, an app that helps provide resources or connect resources to um, migrant farmer communities as they move around. So some of the people who developed that were themselves children of migrant farmers. They knew the community, they knew the issues. After they got this technical training, they were able to be that bridge and actually build a solution that's helping to provide resources to people that they actually need when they actually need them in the different places they need them. Um, I think other projects that organization has done has been around helping people get their driver's license res restored um, and then actually working with city governments to help um, automate that process so that people, after if they've lost their driver's license for whatever reason, uh, when it can be restored, doing that process automatically so they can actually then drive again, back to work, back to their jobs, back to ways to visit or to support their family. So I think this very much is the question of public interest technology and what we're doing. And so um, I think just one other thing as we think about how do we continue to do more of that. I know there's, uh, we're start, people are starting to have conversations amongst some of the funder community as well as to say that in this environment of a number of layoffs in the tech industry, how do we capture some of that talent, maybe provide a buffer between what community-based organizations often pay and the tech sector pays? They're probably not matching it completely, but is there something in between that we can do so we can take that technical talent and pair them with community-based organizations? And so on a day-to-day -day basis, say, what issues do you have around what air quality looks like, what water quality looks like in your area, what water policies look like in your area? And you've got this technical talent here as this resource to understand your issues, who may come from your communities, uh, who may want to learn about those, and then to mm -hmm. build on these solutions together and advocate together for more system, uh, systemic and lasting change. Mm -hmm. I think can I make a specific appeal? Yes, you can. Very quick. So we actually need some technology, technological help. We have the data that we've gained on this survey. We'd like to turn it into an app so that community members can look and see what protections are being provided by their governments in their states and advocate for improvement on particular areas where the government is falling short. Mm -hmm. We think that having an app would go so much further than having a study that people could go to on our website. Mm -hmm. Technologically, we don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping I'll find some partners here. How do people get a hold of Howard you? Law School. To, yeah. If someone wants to do it at how, uh, in partnership with you at Howard Law School, how do they get a hold of you? They can reach me at carlton.waterhouse at Howard. <laughs> well, we look forward to being back here in a year and talking about uh, about about this work. Um, but I'm I saw Kip walk up. I'm seeing you walk towards the stage, so I'm going to take this as the as the clue that uh, we are out of time. So again, want to thank all of our panelists, <laughs> Dr. Molly Tower, Dr. Carlton Waterhouse. Dr. Theodora Dreyer and uh, Dr. Maria Jalsusa, thank you so much for your time and expertise, really reminding us um, that it's important to stay with the trouble and to do the hard work that matters. Thank you to you all for attending, both in person and virtually. Thank you. And uh, please stay around for the afternoon panels today, and I know we have a panel on Monday as well uh, for the AI Symposium. So thank you so much. Thank you. This is great. Give them a great big round of applause. Great big, great big, great big. Thank you so much. And to the moderator, Afua Bruce.